he's going to be a real good interview. And we're live. All right. Welcome to ISO Buddies, ISO Buddies. Um, we are going to have a great show tonight. It's me and Nat. And I'm so good at this now, I know which way to point. It's backwards. So uh, it took me a while to get it. So I always Nat, forget. Nat's audio is awesome. And I love that blouse. Is it a blouse? What do we call it? It is. Awesome. I decided to dress a little fancy today. Oh, well, thank you. I'm in my t-shirt from Firefly. Um, they are nice. They're I don't nice. know this artist's name, but I have seven or eight t-shirts by them. Uh, do you have the cards for your lizard behind you? Is that the ID card the on, card? The, on the yes. case behind you? I have information cards on all of my animals. It's the same ones that I have for all the isopods. We need to put those in the comments section. That guy's link. I think his stuff is fantastic. His? Yeah. Guy, right? Yes, his, his, yes. Okay. All right. I didn't want to yeah, be sexist. Jared. Name. His name is, uh, can I, can I say his name? Yeah. Is that I cool? don't care. Yeah. Uh, his name's Jared Page. Uh, he's okay. phenomenal. He's very, very professional and has almost every animal you can think of. Frogs, mantises, tarantulas. So Won't he do we'll definitely have to put his too? info. Hmm? Won't he do them uh, like custom for you too? For he a price? Yes. Um, the only thing is with customs, he it takes a little bit of time because they are custom and he works with photographers to actually get a very proper image of the animal. Wow. All right. Awesome. Well, enough about that. Our sponsor tonight is Water. So water won't sue us. So we're going to be a sponsor by water. It's delicious. It's good for you. Um, maybe it doesn't have lead in it. I don't know if you're from Michigan. Uh, tonight we're talking about talking to Drew Shells from the Learning Zoo. He is a zookeeper of, you know what? I didn't ask how many years, but we'll ask him right away. But he is a zookeeper, a seasoned zookeeper with a fantastic mustache. Um, and he, he looks like one of those old timey ads, you know, like, just for your calling. Very wholesome, like those yeah. wholesome ads, you know? Try this new elixir. Um, he's that guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, he doesn't sound like that at all. But his learning yeah. zoo is in Conroe, Texas. I guess it's just near Houston. Not mm -hmm. if that's right. Drew, not if that's right. Yes, it's just near Houston. All right. Where I almost moved last year, so I could have visited him. Um, who knows? If we get the camper we're looking for, we might go visit all of our guests and our co-hosts. So without further ado, let me bring on Drew. And you know, you have a couple questions for him too, right? I do. And he has later for us for a treat if you stay tuned in. He has a carpet python. Um, he has a reticulated python. I don't know how large these are. Uh, he has a baby leopard tortoise, which they are adorable. Oh. I'm see one. But they are also a time. Like that age. Right? I love them. Um, he also has a sugar glider he's going to show off. So we're going to hit reptiles and males. Yay marsupial mammals right that'd be a really nice mix i'm excited let's get him on drew on and we're gonna put him on the big screen so that's not it perfection how are we doing tonight drew we're doing great josh thanks for having me today <laughs> you got it and you no, know i'm, you I'm doing great how are you guys all right this guy's been doing phenomenal who do we have today jeremy leopard tortoise jeremy's already excited about a leopard tortoise jerry's one of our jeremy's one of our non-expert experts um, so your zoo, you just opened a learning zoo, kind of a, it's the learning zoo. Um, yes, it is the learning zoo. Um, you know, we're, we were trying to pick a name and, um, so I will get into all this when we talk about, uh, college and all that, but I, I got my degree from the teaching zoo in Florida. So I, uh, you know, the, the joke is I learned at the teaching zoo and now I teach at the learning zoo. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I like that a lot, actually. That's very clever. Thank um, you. So now what, uh, so you said you learned at a Florida zoo, the teacher right. zoo in Florida. So how does that work? Like, did you kind of intern there and then work? Uh, the no, so it's, it's even cooler than that. So uh, there's a school in Gainesville, Florida, uh, Santa Fe College that has a zookeeper training program. It's a two-year associate's degree in zoo animal technology. Uh, and so it's, you know, it's an associate's degree. You get uh, a college diploma. I have mine hanging over there on the wall. Uh, okay. But uh, basically, while you're in the program, you're taking classes in things like animal nutrition, herpetoculture, um, aquarium culture, um, operant conditioning, public speaking, uh, the ethics of animals in captivity, which was really, really interesting to, to start off the, the whole program with. That was one of the first classes we took. And then while you're doing all of that in the classroom, you're also putting in 20 hours a week 
in uh, labs, which is basically just taking care of a 10 acre AZA accredited zoo on campus. Oh my gosh. So that yeah, the amazing. students are the primary keepers. Like they, there are maybe four or five paid staff who are all just like supervisors, dire the director, the curator. Um, and then the, the students are taking care of everything. So you have one semester where they kind of show you the ropes and you know teach you how to do things properly and safely. And then you're working with birds of prey, you're working with um, hoofstock, small cats. Uh, our reptile house had venomous snakes, crocodilians, um, trying to think what else. We had tree kangaroos, we had Galapagos tortoises, we had a 12 foot alligator named Brutus. Um, and then you know some of the species are extinct in the wild, they're endangered, they're part of uh, species oh, survival wow. plans. So uh, the, the work you're doing is legitimate you're you're a zookeeper before you graduate and then uh of course when you do leave you can move on to internships and jobs in the field with this incredible thing on your resume saying i was a aza zookeeper for two years while learning all about how to do the job that is so cool that's that's a job i've always wanted like i love zoos and i have to justify them to people a lot like you were saying that the oh, ethics okay. of keeping animals most zoos that are like you're saying accredited uh they work with breeding programs to help perpetuate these species in the oh, wild yeah. that are yeah, they, they have to. it's like. part of getting that accreditation is that they they have to donate a certain percentage of their profits to conservation and they have to uh work with the ssps they can't just hoard endangered animals to themselves if they want to be in the in the family so to speak What's what's SSP oh, wow. for those of us that don't know what's SSP? No, uh, species survival, species survival plan. So okay. that's something that the AZA sets up to basically manage the population of say red wolves, jaguars. Uh, you know, a species that you know you might have two hundred of them across North America, and that sounds like a lot, but they're all related to each other in some manner. So you have to yeah. manage that population, make sure you're not inbreeding. And um, they'll send out recommendations. So, you know, pair this leopard from San Antonio with this leopard from uh, Miami and uh, go from there. Well, yeah, because now they do genetic testing on their stock, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. On yeah. All of their stock. Uh, yeah. The, the level of, um, I guess, science behind this is something that people don't understand. Like, you know, SeaWorld's orca population is probably the most managed, like genetically um, managed group of mammals that I am aware of, um, other than okay. say like red wolves or cheetahs where the genetic diversity is tiny. Okay. Okay, so they, uh, SeaWorld is kind of a controversial. Oh yeah, Zoom sorry, I didn't, right I didn't right invoke that, but no. No, I, that's a, we're a controversial show, let me tell you. <laughs> let me tell you. Yeah, but no, um, I, I, I love SeaWorld. I, uh, support them fully. Get mad about it. Okay. No, that's fine. Like, what? Um, what would you say to defend them? I guess. Like, what would be a defense of what they do? As far as, um, like, you hear all kinds of horror stories, and uh, obviously those sell. Those are yeah. the worse. The story is the more um, attention it gets, right? Yeah. So, absolutely. what's a good story? Or what's a good purpose of SeaWorld that we don't see in the news in the media? Uh, well, for one thing. Um, we know very, very little about uh, orcas in the wild. We know almost nothing about how their bodies work because you can't just pull up to a wild orca and you know take their their vitals. Sure. So um, in order to actually learn how their bodies work, how they process certain uh, things like even just food, how long their gestation is, um, how often they cycle and ovulate, you can't find that out on a wild animal. You need to be able to, you know, examine a, a captive animal on a regular basis in a non-invasive way. Um, and so operant conditioning and cooperative healthcare with SeaWorld's orcas has taught marine biologists almost everything they know about how their biology works. Okay. All right. That's, that's pretty fair. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Cause it's definitely is educational for the, um, they can use that and put that information to use in the wild oh, for the wild populations. Um, Orcas aren't really doing bad, though, are they? They're pretty uh, much... Certain predators. populations are pretty rough. A lot of people don't realize that, like, they're considered one species, but each individual population 
is its own distinct group genetically. There's um, there's nomadic orcas and there's kind of coastal resident orcas, and those two groups have not interbred in almost ten thousand years. So they're basically distinct species, and each pod doesn't really interbreed with neighboring groups. So uh, like the the northwestern resident orcas, the ones you see from British Columbia down to Seattle and Oregon, they are their own distinct population and they're on their way out. Like they're they're dying off because of uh, food shortages mostly. Okay. A lot of okay. overfishing in those areas makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah, so orcas as a species, we think they're doing okay, but that depends on your definition of a species. We may, you know, a hundred years from now, analyze their DNA or look at something else and realize, oh, there were 20 species of them and we've lost 15. Yeah. Like tigers. Exactly. There's, exactly. there's like, so many different types of tigers people yeah. are unaware of that mm -hmm. actually a few that still exist that people don't realize they're different. Yeah, we've, we've lost three subspecies of tiger in the last hundred years. And back then everyone thought a tiger is a tiger. That's crazy. That's crazy. Um, now we're way off track as usual. <laughs> yeah, no, sorry. I, <laughs> I'd, uh, it's, it's okay. Hey, that's it's, what we do. That's, we're talking about animals. We're still talking about animals. And we still that's tie true. it together with what you've learned and you're teaching us. Because I would have had, I, I grew up in Florida and I grew up with a very controversial, like you don't go see the shows, you don't go support SeaWorld. And listening to your explanation of how you're absolutely correct. You can't just go up to a wild orca mm -hmm. and go check its vitals and go see how long it takes for it to digest its food, just as you mentioned. You know, having a controlled environment really gives the scientists and biologists a firsthand view of all this information. So you've changed my viewpoint. So that going off topic happy. helps and could, you know. <laughs> We're learning from the learning zoo today. Exactly. So that's good. And that's the whole point. We're learning. <laughs> I didn't really have a viewpoint because I just love zoos. I love to go and see animals that I don't normally get to see. Um, I love to touch the animals I'm not supposed to touch. Like if I have an opportunity, I definitely do it. Um, I haven't been kicked out of a zoo yet, but close, close. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I see the t-shirts sometimes that say every zoo is a petting zoo if you're not a coward. And <laughs> they're funny, but I also know exactly how much, uh, like coworkers and, and colleagues in the field hate those people. I, I try to do it when there's no one else around. Like, I don't want to promote anyone else doing it. Uh, but I consider myself a professional as like a long-term vet tech. Mm -hmm. I kind of know the signs to look for if I'm going to get mauled or something. Um, so I try not to do that. But um, yeah, so I try to make sure there's everybody no listening. You, you see how he just made that disclaimer. He has, he does have experience with different some animals. Some training. Did work as a I have vet some tech. training. So, don't yeah. some training. Here, so don't go around just poking stuff. We're semi professional. <laughs> well, I'm semi professional. Drew's the professional. <laughs> Plus, I'm six foot four. Like, you can't keep me out of reaching for animals. You can't. You can't. Um, so now how long have you been a zookeeper? Like how much experience do you have as an actual zookeeper? Uh, well, I, I started the, the zoo animal tech program at Santa Fe in 2019 or no, no, that's completely wrong. Sorry. 2015. Uh, okay. so going on six years this month, since I started really working with exotic animals on a daily basis. But before that I've been keeping reptiles for 15 years as, as a hobby and, uh, doing educational programs. So depending on how you want to define it, I mean, I've been I've been doing the work I've been doing for about 15 years. I feel like anybody keeping reptiles, uh, any serious hobbyist really gets into the animal husbandry and the, mm -hmm. the climatology they're from, like or the, clim the climate that they're from, not the climatology. But then they do a setup that's very yeah. appropriate for those animals. Yeah, no, some, um, some species are so delicate that you basically need to be a, a zookeeper in your spare time in order to keep them properly and keep them healthy. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Very, like, Nat has a, basically a small zoo at her place, so she's got a tegu who hates the color blue. Ooh. So, uh, Kyle's tegu doesn't hate blue, by the way. Like, he's tried seven different shades, and he doesn't hate blue. So, <laughs> it must just be your angry tegu. I'm telling you, she, she she conditioned herself with the color blue, and so we just we keep it away from her now. <laughs> she attacks like cornflower blue. She just hates it. That's so, so weird. 
is. It is. It's, it's, it's very, very smart, though. So there's like I'm sure there's something that happened that made her associate it with something, and you know, we yeah, we talked about this. Yes, it's 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 a very odd thing that had her associate the color blue. But yes, it's it's definitely a conditioning <laughs> thing that that she's done. We'll just leave it at that. Yeah, we'll just leave it at that. I saw the video. It's pretty hilarious. But um, more on that later. That'll be another video that we post. Um, so now all this experience with these animals, uh, let's say I, I wanted to ask this of all of my guests. So do you have first an, a, a really great success story as a zookeeper? Like whether it's at your private zoo now or like you're the one you own or as a keeper or as a student? Um, I've, I've got a few, but I think my favorite okay. is probably uh, with alligators. So okay. I love crocodilians. We don't have any right now because the restrictions in the county that we're in are ridiculous. Uh, in order to keep any crocodilian, I would have to uh, have an enclosure that meets certain specifications and is a thousand feet from our nearest neighbors. And the way our property is set up and laid out, we just there's nowhere that I can put it that's far enough away. So okay. uh, no crocodilians right now. But a couple of years ago, I did work at a water park in. Uh, New Caney, about 45 minutes to an hour from here, and they had uh, alligators. It was, okay. you know, like I was working in the, the dry attractions. So we had a petting zoo. We had a, you know, reptile collection with, you know, some education animals. And then we had uh, six juvenile alligators, about four to five feet long. So, you know, big enough to, to mess you up if they wanted to, but not huge. Those are juveniles, and, folks. Those are juveniles. Yeah. Those are angry teenagers. Yes, exactly. Two of our males uh, started getting testy with each other that summer. That was fun. But um, they were super smart. And so we, um, this was our first summer being open, actually. And so I was in charge of doing alligator shows. And oh. uh, we would go in there and, you know, we would, we would uh, feed them while we talked about them. And we ran into some problems that they have excellent hearing. Uh, people don't understand how smart crocodilians are. Their hearing is exceptional um, because they vocalize more than any other reptile. They're basically birds with scales. So they would hear, you know, keys jingling uh, as we opened the lock to their enclosure. Oh, and nice. this, this one male, he was about four and a half, five feet. Uh, he, he grew almost two feet that summer, but he would oh sprint from the water right up to the gate and sit right there waiting for us because he knew we had food. <laughs> he had to be so, first. Yeah, so we, we had to figure out a way to you know put a stop to that. What we did was we trained them to go into the water when we rang a cowbell. So okay. ding, ding, ding. We would throw pellets into the water for them. They would go eat those. Uh, and pretty soon they figured out, okay, when the bell rings, we go into the water. We would go in and we had a box built up on the shore of the pond uh, that was maybe raised up a foot and had two foot high walls. So we could climb into it and they couldn't reach us at that size. Sure. So we would get in the box. We would lay out a piece of AstroTurf on the, the ground next to us. And basically they did not get fed unless we were in the box and they were either in the water or on that piece of AstroTurf. They're smart. Uh, they learn. Yes. Oh, they, they learned that within about a week. And I did not I, think they were smart at all. Yeah, within three or four months, I was able to call each one of them up individually uh, by name. They would come stand in front of me on the AstroTurf, open their mouth, and I would throw food directly in and then send them back into the water. That's and they, crazy. they learned that in less than a month from start to finish. And we just kept reinforcing it. And it got to the point where once we were done feeding, we'd you know take the AstroTurf up, I'd get out of the box. And I could walk up to them and just touch their backs, rub their tails, do whatever. They knew there was no food coming, so they didn't care. That's amazing. You don't think about I, their hearing. They do that. Um, the big males do that thing where they kind of arch their back in the water and use a mm -hmm. substance. Yeah, that's yeah, great. that that's um, a mating call. So they actually use uh, infrasound, which is really low frequency noises, um, and it's really difficult for them to produce. So they're showing off when they do that, and all crocodilians. Uh, produce it to some degree, and then the, the babies will also uh, make that chirping noise uh, as, a, sure. as a stress. So, like, people are 
surprised to learn this, but crocodilians are more closely related to birds than they are to turtles, snakes, lizards, other reptiles that we think of in the same group. That's crazy. You don't think about that at all. Yeah, yeah but they, they share Not a common ancestor with uh, dinosaurs, which of course, you know, became birds. So they're very, very similar behaviorally. Well, because they've been around since that time, basically. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, yeah. But, more like, or less unchanged. ish animals have been around longer than the dinosaurs. That's crazy. Yeah, and they're I, still I, here. Like, I could talk survive. about them all day, even though I don't have any. <laughs> I'm sure. I mean, if I had one, I would definitely talk about it. Yeah. No, um, one, of, one of the dream species for me is uh, Chinese alligators. Okay. I don't know if it's ever going to happen. It might. It might not. Um, I know somebody who has some and he's been successful breeding them but uh i also don't know if i'm ever going to be in a position where i can afford them and uh, where i have the space for them wow that's how crazy. large do they get in comparison Ooh, four or five feet like they they have an alligator temperament so they're very laid back compared to other species okay. they only get four to five maybe six feet for a really big male and they're cold tolerant so they could live outdoors here in houston year-round which is what my my friend who breeds them does Oh wow, mm -hmm. that's amazing! Yeah. No, they're they're Very the perfect cool. crocodilian. Uh, I crocodilians don't make good pets. I'm going to preface that, but <laughs> of the species that exist, they are probably the best suited for private ownership. Okay, doesn't make them good pets, but they are probably the least bad. Would you say they're a great display animal if you know what you're doing? <clears throat> um, not a great display animal because they're they're very shy. They'll hide most of the time. Okay, but they're they're hardy, they're easy to uh, care for if you know reptiles, and they're not going to eat you. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, well, let's get into your zoo a little bit. So sure. we're going to have the link to yeah. that. To Sorry, his I'm trying to keep these lights behind my head. <laughs> <That's different. laughs> okay. We're going to deal with it. It's like a halo. It's like uh, God sent you to us. Some God. I'm not going to get into that. Um, as controversial as we were at SeaWorld, we're going to keep religion out of it. Uh, so you said before the show that your new zoo, you bought the property uh, basically a year ago. Mm -hmm. So happy anniversary. Thank you. Um, and then when did you start populating animals? You said was not that long ago, right? Um, no, I mean, we, we had some of the animals, like the, the smaller reptiles, uh, before we bought the property because I had already started doing... Um, you know, traveling programs with them. But we okay. started moving animals to the property in about June of last year. Uh, because when we bought it, there was not a lot ready. Like we needed to finish the perimeter fence. We needed to clear a lot of the junk off of the, the property. But uh, we started moving animals out in June. And okay. now we have somewhere between 50 and 70 individual vertebrates, depending on your definition of an animal. We don't really count the isopods. We don't count the, you know, the feeder rodents usually. But uh, we we have a, a good number of reptiles, uh, a few birds, some mammals. If you want some isopods, let me know. I know a guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, podcast. No, I have some myself. But um, we know pretty much everybody in the business right now, some way, shape, or form. Oh, Nat's yeah, it's very popular. Nat has a million species. I have like thirty-five. Isopods are the stuff. If I could make money with an isopod zoo, I would do it. But I don't think anyone's going to pay for that. Yeah, like, no, that, that's that's the problem I run into because I love carpet pythons. They're probably one of my favorite animals. Sorry, I'm I'm checking. I have my my male carpet on a, a perch right now, and I'm just checking periodically to make sure he's still there. <laughs> uh, but, no, I, I have a pair of juggles right now. I would love to have every species and subspecies of carpet python. There's maybe eight total, depending on who you ask, but okay. uh, nobody's going to pay to come to a zoo that has, you know, 15 of the same kind of snake to their eyes. This one has different spots. Can you yeah. tell? No, this this one's red. I promise. That's cool. <laughs> I mean, you could keep them in your house. So mm -hmm. how's, how's licensing? How difficult? I mean, you're in Texas. It's probably different for every state, but... It, it is, uh, and it, it's different for every county. Uh, Texas... Okay as a state doesn't have a lot of restrictions. Um, I don't know if you guys saw on the news, but a couple weeks ago, there was someone with a, a tiger in downtown Houston who yes. uh, the, the tiger was their pet and it got out of their house. Yeah, I heard it was in downtown Houston, like right in the city, right? Or no? Uh, suburbs, suburbs. Okay. Houston. 
Just so, imagine that. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, in within Harris County, that person was guilty of a Class C misdemeanor because they didn't have a permit for their tiger. A misdemeanor. Yes. Yes. So that might be a thousand dollar fine maximum, like probably. Yeah. Slap uh, on the wrist. Yeah. They and they did find the guy. Like he he loaded the tiger up and drove away, and they were looking for him, but they did find him. Uh, but no, that's um, so. It depends on the county uh, where we are. It's a little bit stricter than that, but not okay. much. But uh, the other thing we have to worry about since we're uh, you know open to the public for an exhibitor is uh, USDA requires a license for animal exhibitors that have exotic mammals. So if we had anything like primates, kangaroos, um, foxes, things like that, we would need that license. And we don't currently because to do that, you need to have a few things that we don't have in place yet. Like um, we're working on getting a dedicated kitchen set up for the animals. Uh, that's one of the big ones is that they don't want you mixing uh, human and animal food in the same area. Uh, yeah. And then there's a few other things. It's not difficult to get. I mean, every every roadside zoo you've ever been to is USDA licensed. Like Joe Exotic could get a USDA license if that tells you anything. He's my hero. He's not. He's not. But that was one of the best shows I've ever seen. Like, oh, it was fascinating because uh, I heard so many people uh, like asking me about it, and like, I I just watched Tiger King. Is that really what it's like? And then part of me was like. Oh God, it's not all like that. Please, please don't think that all zoos are like that. But also, yeah, they were not exaggerating most of the stuff on there. There are enough that are like that. They're basically animal hoarders that charge admission. Yeah, so. or they're like, like the the thing I always told people when that came out is that like Joe is not a zookeeper. He's a he's a redneck tiger farmer. Yeah, he's a he's a, a performer. Mm -hmm. That is a perfect no, he's, description. He's he's a, a performer with a sideline in uh, like livestock production. Yeah, if you haven't seen the show, uh, maybe look for the maybe episode. Maybe yourself. You'll yeah, never maybe look yeah, for just the scene. A little bit. There's one scene where he's in the lion cage and the lion starts to drag him off by the boot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's maybe the best thing I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. So. No, I I remember uh, the first time I became aware of his existence uh, was. In the fall of 2016, I was in my last semester at the teaching zoo, and we were hanging out in the break room between classes, like on our lunch break. And somebody was on Facebook, and they pulled up this thing and said, "Guys, you have to see this. This guy's crazy." And it was his uh, presidential campaign ad. Yes. And yes. we were just sitting there picking it apart, like he's in. He's in with a bunch of big cats. He's housing lions, tigers, and ligers together. He has a freaking leg brace so he's he's an injured animal in with these predators and or the pistol the on his hip thing is totally on its own but we're like focusing on the the animal stuff because we're all yeah. you know, animal nerds and it's like you know we've had this drilled into us you know you don't do any of these things and yeah he's yeah, just got a I, pistol I, on I, his hip he's yeah. talking about you know being a gun toting president it's mm -hmm. uh, yeah that mullet Anyway, all right, we're way off track. Yeah. Like, it sucks. Let's not talk about him as a zoo anymore. Sorry I brought it up. I, I, I love, I could talk about him for a whole show. Um, so now, what's, what's, I ask everybody about this that I can because I think it's important for new keepers of animals, of any animals, to hear from the professionals a failure story. So do you have a story for us that's like your personal failure i know it's a personal story but um and if you're not comfortable by all means no no i'm i'm fine sharing i'm just trying to think of one that's um that's gonna be a good story um when i lost my leg to a crocodile no i mean you you can't see anything below here maybe i don't have a leg but uh no, be a torso. we don't know no i i'm a you know a walt disney uh, head in a freezer <laughs> Um, no, I'm, I'm, I definitely have had some, uh, I'm completely blanking right now, but, um, how about something that's been a big question. learning experience for you? I'm sorry. I was like, how about maybe if you can't think of something off the top, um, how about something that was like a really big learning experience for you? Something that was mm, kind of like mm. a, Oh, wow. Like one of those just or it really like 
like for example for me right now it's learning that gators have insane or and crocodilians have insane hearing like mm -hmm. that's <laughs> i'm not gonna lie to you that's something that uh shocked me but obviously something a little more in depth than that uh oh, oh yeah I, I just thought of one okay so this is uh definitely kind of a sad story but we uh when we first started build, building the animal collection for this property we uh, one of the first animals we brought in was a miniature donkey. His name was Coco Bean, and he was very, very sweet with people. Uh, like he was basically a big dog with hooves. He'd follow you around. He'd, uh, you know, bump your head if he wanted attention. Uh, he was wonderful, and uh, you know, he was going to be one of the the signature animals in our petting zoo. And we, uh, a few months later, got a pair of Kuni Kuni piglets. Which, if you don't know what Kuni Kuni are, listeners, they are the best pig ever. Uh, they're these hairy little pigs from New Zealand, and they're so friendly. They're like Labrador retrievers. Uh, and they don't dig as much as other pigs. They have a, a very short kind of bulldog snout, so they graze. Uh, people raise them on pasture uh, like a cow. And we got a pair of them, um, little little babies about the size of a, uh, a house cat. And they were adorable. We loved them. Uh, we you know, brought them back to the zoo and put them in the petting zoo and the donkey immediately attacked them. Oh, God. He, he went after them. We separated them, you know, pulled them out, uh, you know, put him a, off somewhere else. And we're like, okay, well, maybe it's just, uh, you know, maybe it's just, uh, you know, they're, they're new. He's never seen one before. He'll get used to it. And so we had them set up with a fence in between them so they could, you know, see and smell and hear each other. And they stayed like that for a few weeks. And then one day he somehow managed to get into their pen um like opened a gate or you know jumped the fence or something and he attacked those pigs with vengeance i don't know why he hated them so much but he was actively chasing them down and cornering them um one of them was trampled to the point that we couldn't save him uh the vet said that he had internal bleeding and ruptures the other one lost part of her tail uh, it was bitten off and she had a, a big welt on her side for about two weeks afterwards from where he had kicked her. So we, you know, were devastated by that. We separated them more so that there was no possibility of him getting to them. And then uh, the next day, he trampled three chickens. Holy cow! And he had what never been with chickens up until then, like they had lived with him for for weeks, and he didn't care. But at that point, we said, "Okay, this is a problem." Uh, not sure why he's getting like this. He's not a teenager or anything. He's he's you know mature, so it's not puberty. But we can't have this. You know we can't trust sure. an animal like that that's going to attack small beings because you know we're supposed to have little kids in here. Uh, so we had to find a home for Coco Bean. He went to a farm nearby where he has a a female miniature donkey and a couple acres of grass. And he's He's doing well, you know. He's making little little health spawn babies. Okay, all right. Well, that's health spawn. Yeah, donkey. that was uh, that was a lesson for me that donkeys don't like pigs. Um, to the point that they uh, get using them as guard them. animals, or you know, putting them out in a, a pasture with their sheep or goats to protect them. Donkeys will not protect anything else. They will protect themselves if they feel they're in danger. Okay. Uh, they'll, they'll attack a coyote because they feel it's a threat to them. They'll also trample a, a baby goat or a pig if they feel like it's a danger to them. All right. So that was a that was a big learning experience. So a thought that oh, the man. pig was a danger, possibly. Mm -hmm. I I looked into it, and apparently a lot of donkeys are like that because pigs remind them of dogs. Apparently, I don't okay. know if there's ah. a lot of truth to that, but that's the the explanation that was given by a lot of people that I asked. That's strange. Interesting. Yeah. So now, speaking Aww. of the petting zoo, what's mm -hmm. in there now? Uh, well, we have the uh, the original pig that uh, made okay. all that minus about that much of her tail, and she's amazing. Uh, her name is Pua, and my my fiance considers her our firstborn child. <laughs> um, we we have another Kuni Kuni now as well, another female Penny, uh, and the two of them are inseparable. And then we also have uh, Nigerian dwarf goats, um, and then the chickens, which are not really friendly, but um, they're they're good lawn ornaments, and they they make eggs, which we hatch and uh, use the the chicks as snake food. Oh, all right. 
<laughs> yeah, they're just I love it. <laughs> kids, uh, snake food. Uh, yeah, they're, uh, we, we're self-sufficient in terms of feeding our, our carnivores. Oh, I was just yeah, looking into quail. Here, which the, the carpet python is crawling over here, so I'll, I'll keep an eye oh, on him. Oh, let's get him out. Let's get him out. Let's All bring right. him on. Yeah, let me, let me grab him. He's one of my favorites. I was literally about to start asking about some of the reptiles. <laughs> All right. Good, good. I think we can talk about that while we're looking at the carpet reptile, the carpet python, too. I've never seen a carpet python. I'm kind of excited. I've seen carpet. Oh, they're gorgeous. And, okay. and and I understand what he means about all the different colors because they come in a variety of shades. Mm -hmm. So this is Chester. He is a jungle carpet python. Okay. Uh, he's oh, our adult male. He's a little over six feet long. Um, and he's, he's about seven, eight years old. Uh, we have a pair of these guys right now. Our female is actually sitting on <laughs> eggs at the moment. Um, we're letting her maternally incubate. We have a clutch of 11 this year, and this is, uh, knock on wood, my first time breeding carpet pythons, so hopefully she'll uh, do a good job with, with those, and we'll get some babies. Now, is that something they do? Like, they just wash the eggs, right? That's uh... Uh, Yeah, yeah. pythons are the only snakes that will provide parental care, and they'll actually wrap around the eggs uh, in what's called a beehive, and the eggs okay. will stick together. So they'll they'll glue into a, a single it's mass. It's a crazy love. For to, to hold together. And they'll they'll keep them the right temperature and humidity. They'll actually shiver to heat okay. themselves up and transfer that heat to the eggs. And they'll uh, they'll breathe into the coils to increase the humidity, because like all animals, they'll release water vapor with their breath. So they can increase the humidity. They can decrease the humidity by loosening their coils. Uh, it's fascinating. It is so crazy what animals know how to do from instinct. And mm -hmm. human babies That's are basically incredible. useless. Like human babies can't. Like it took my daughter five days to learn how to suck on a bottle. Like, come on, you can't even feed. He's gorgeous. Yeah, now, he's what, he's one of my favorites. He seems really chill, and he's a ham, is what he is. Yeah, no, he he's a, a he steals the show. Whenever I have him out um, at programs, I always tell people, you know, like at some point he is probably going to climb up on top of my head, and uh, I wear a like a crocodile Dundee style bush hat when I go out to programs um, and he will curl up on top of it, like wrap around the crown and just rest on the brim. And um, people go crazy for that. Like they think that's the funniest thing they've ever seen. That's awesome. That would be cool. So do you bring him out to, can people handle him or, or pet him? Or uh, so him? I, I definitely love when people pet him because that helps dispel so much fear, so many misconceptions. We keep control of all the animals. Uh, like I'm not going to just hand a snake over to a, a kid because, sure. you know, I trust them, uh, but I don't trust those people. Sure. They're, you know, I don't trust them to not do something stupid or, you know, get scared when it twitches and drop drop an animal on the ground or even just to have him go into their shirt, that suddenly becomes a, a very long involved process to get him out. <laughs> so like, uh, you know, we'll, we'll let kids uh, hold his back end for photos or, you know, like put him over their shoulders, but I'm always in control of the, the front end. Sure, sure. That makes sense. Um, Nat, you said you had some questions about reptiles, yeah? Oh, yeah. well, of course. <laughs> I know. I, I know. I've been doing all the talking this episode, so I feel like it's very I know. Good. I was like, we usually do a back and forth. He got a little selfish, this one. Super so. selfish. <laughs> Take it away. 40 you minutes of talking, Josh. Of, good uh, job. Chester and I to go around. <laughs> Uh, so speaking of reptiles, I know you kind of mentioned some of the snakes you have, but mm -hmm. what other reptiles do you have? Uh, well, we have uh, as much of a variety as I can manage. We've got our two carpet pythons. Uh, we have a reticulated python I'll bring out in a little bit. Um, we have a couple of corn snakes. Uh, we have a king snake, uh, California king. She's gorgeous. Um, we have a Texas rat snake right now that a friend gave me when he was moving out of the country. She's uh, a rescue from the wild, uh, so she's not friendly, but she's also only about a foot long, so I don't worry about it too much. Okay. Um, and then trying to think, carpet pythons, retic, horns, king, rat snake. That's, that's all we have for the snakes at the moment. Uh, and then rept uh, as far as lizards go, we have a blue tongue skink, a couple bearded dragons. We have... Um, some geckos. We have a gargoyle gecko, a leopard gecko. Um, we have a couple of, of other animals. Um, oh, green iguana. 
which is uh, awesome. He's very, very chill for an iguana. Uh, they're usually super high strong. I was about to ask. Evil. Yes, because I used to own one. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but no, he's, yeah. he's awesome. <laughs> um, and uh, then I'm actually about to get a uh, Asian water monitor in a couple Fun. weeks and then hoping to get some frilled dragons later this summer as well. Oh, wow. Ooh, frills are amazing. They're yeah. such a funny species, such personalities. <laughs> I've never kept them, but I've always wanted uh, Australian frills because they you have the, the Australian and the New Zealand locale, or not New Zealand, New Guinea localities. New Guinea. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. and I've, like the New Guinea ones are okay, but they're they're usually wild caught and they're they're not as big, they're not as colorful. Uh, so I, I always told myself, I'm gonna hold off, I'm gonna get the big red Aussie frilled lizards that I you know see on, on TV. And I finally found somebody who uh, breeds them and he's gonna have a clutch uh, or two later this year that I'm hoping to get a few from. That's Yay. Awesome. Super yeah, exciting. We, we do keep a lot of our, uh, our lizards outside uh, because Texas is pretty great for that. Um, average temperature most of the year is uh, between 75 and 95. So as long as you provide shade in the summer, they're, they're great. And then in the winter, we kept our green iguana outside year round uh, by wrapping his enclosure in greenhouse plastic and hanging some heaters ah. over the winter. And then we, we brought him inside when we had that big freeze in February. Of course. But, uh, yeah. yeah, otherwise I, I was able to keep him outside and that was kind of the the test run for the other lizards going forward. So this winter I'm planning to keep uh, at least one of the beardies outside, the iguana, uh, and then eventually I'd like to move frilled lizards and the, the monitor outside when they're bigger. Nice. That's super cool. Yeah. Oh, Very totally fun. Cool. Um, I, I was going to say, I was like... Have, yeah, we have a ton of uh, redfoot tortoises. We have two leopard tortoises, the baby, and then uh, an adult outside, 35, 40-year-old female. We have... Uh, some smaller sulcata tortoises, about that big. And then we have a big male. He's maybe uh, three, three and a half feet long, 90, 95 pounds. Uh, and he's, he's amazing. Um, but yeah, we, we love the tortoises. Um, watching them eat is one of the things that helps me relax at the end of the day. Uh, just, you know, watching a tortoise eat something is the best uh, ASMR video on earth. <laughs> It really is. It really is. Like I had the pleasure of watching a, a actually another person and who's been on the show named Tanya. I got to watch her tortoises. She's got one humongous male with two females, and uh, it it was definitely an experience. I got to feed them some really fun stuff, and it's just like that that such yes. a slow bite and like hearing the crunch. Yes, very. Very soothing for sure. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I fell in love with tortoises at uh, the Santa Fe Teaching Zoo. We had three Galapagos tortoises, and I was lucky enough to be Ooh. one of their trainers in my my senior year. So we would oh, have them exciting. target trained to follow us into their barn in the winter. Now and, I'm uh, from the era. I'm old enough that I uh, got to ride Galapagos tortoises as a kid because oh my God. back when zoos just abused their animals and didn't <laughs> care. Um, so I have photos of me riding a Galapagos tortoise, and I'm not proud of it. But I mean, I was four; like it wasn't my choice. Yeah, no, I, I have a, a video or I have a picture from like 1997 of me feeding an elephant at a, a zoo somewhere in California, and that they don't let you do that anymore. But it was also 1997 and i was two years <laughs> old so you know whatever I also got to ride an elephant and a camel so there you go <laughs> oh they still do elephant rides at our, our local renaissance fair oh wow oh do they yeah, yeah. that's, that's uh, crazy that is a hit or miss like i've seen too mm -hmm. many videos of elephants losing their crap and yeah, destroying they, people they kill more zookeepers than any other animal in uh like in the zoo field Really? Oh wow! Uh, yeah, that's that's why maybe five years ago the AZA actually um, passed a new requirement for accreditation that zoos cannot be uh, hands-on with their elephants anymore. They have to uh, work with them through a barrier. You can't just walk in with them anymore. Okay. Oh wow! I mean, I've seen oh, enough stuff nice. on YouTube or animal attack videos, and yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah, no, I, like part of uh, one of our classes was we, we had to watch 
uh, some of those videos. One was an elephant. I think one was a, a lion at like a, a Vegas hotel. Like MGM used to have a, a lion exhibit in their casino. And there's a video wow. of uh, a lion attacking one of the keepers there. And our instructor was literally going like, okay, pause. This is what they're doing wrong. This is what the lion's telling them. They're not listening. Continue. Okay, here's when they should have gotten out and they didn't. And then continue. And the lion's dragging the guy around by his leg. Unreal. Unreal. Yeah. yeah. And you're thinking, I'm, I'm guessing they are thinking about the show. They're not thinking about the, the things the lion's telling them. Yeah. No. Yeah. And not I mean, I'm, I'm very aware of uh, the body language with our animals when we're doing shows. If they are getting at all, you know, upset, if they're, you know, getting tense, they're trying to, you know, get out of my hands, then I'll, you know, I'll, I'll wrap it up and, and put them back and let them calm down. But uh, I'm, I'm fortunate that he has, uh, he in particular has never given me any trouble. Uh, our female is mean. Like she, she will try to eat anything until she figures out that she can't swallow it. Okay. And uh, ever since she laid her eggs, she has been just hyper vigilant, looking for something to grab onto. I don't. Okay. I think she's partially hungry. She's partially defending the nest, but uh, like I, I don't mess with her because I'm not brave enough. And she's uh, her enclosure is at eye level. So if she's going to latch on to anything, it'll be my face. Fantastic. So is that why you're letting so, her raise the eggs? Because you're scared of her? or <laughs> I, I mean, I wasn't looking forward to going in there and taking, her, uh, taking them from her. But at the same time, uh, this is my first year breeding carpet pythons. And this is her first time being bred. So I figure okay. neither of us knows what they're doing. But she has instinct and nothing else to do. I have sure. an entire zoo to run. So... I'll let her take care of that. <laughs> I think Fair that's enough. a better, I don't know. I think personally that's a better situation if they're not going to eat their young. You know, yeah. there's not really yeah. a chance of that then. No, like uh, king snakes, I believe you have to take the eggs out or the female will eat them like within a day or two of laying them. Okay. okay. Because king snakes, snakes eat other snakes. Right? Yeah, they eat other snakes in the wild. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. I had ours uh, the other day. I was feeding her and she had shed her skin. So I gave her the mouse and, you know, she starts swallowing it. I go to grab the shed while her mouth is full so I can just, you know, reach in and take it. She lets go of the mouse, grabs onto the shed skin, and starts trying to swallow it. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. goodness. Yeah, I, I have a picture of her, like, with the shed in her mouth, hanging onto it. And um, she she let go after a minute. Like, I was able to get away from her, and she went back to the mouse. But that was just like, what are you doing? What are you doing? I thought it was a snake. You're going to have to get her some snake. Yeah, right, right. There you go. So speaking of feeding mice, I was going to mm -hmm. ask, obviously, every every reptile is going to be different. You said, obviously, you have a lot of carnivores and stuff like that. Obviously, mm -hmm. all the snakes are going to be strictly carnivores and different sizes they feed at different times. But do you generally have a feeding schedule that kind of coincides with most of the snakes that you're able to feed all in one go? Or do you no. kind of just have like kind a feeding of. chart of and keep track of who was fed when and kind of so um i am very i'm very laissez-faire when it comes to feeding my snakes because i i pretty firmly believe that they get fed way too much in captivity they're not exercising they're You're not correct. hunting they're not going anywhere they're not burning calories uh so i feed my carpet pythons uh the adults get fed once a month They'll get a, like a large rat or an adult quail or you know mid-sized chicken, but uh, once a month. Same for the retic. Um, he's significantly bigger, but uh, he's also an adult male. He's done growing. He's not breeding. So, you know, I'm I'm very kind of benignly like, oh, it's been a while since I've fed you. Okay, here you go. And they do great on that. Like you can see, he's he's lean, he's muscular, he's in pretty good condition. Very active. Uh, oh yeah, like he carpet pythons will eat whenever you give them food, whether they're hungry or not. Uh, so it's very very easy to overfeed these guys. And like I'm, falsies. Yeah, yeah. Like they'll they'll eat whenever, but their metabolism doesn't keep up with it. So if you power feed mm. a carpet python, it'll get huge, like eight ten feet, and it'll die at seven years old instead of living to their twenties. So fat, fatty liver disease and yeah, all that. Yeah. Like I, I, I've seen yeah. 
horror pictures of should be, but I got him as an yeah. adult, so I, I can't do anything about that. But like you can see, he's he's got good muscle condition. Um, the colubrids, like the corn snake, the king snake, I feed a little bit more often. Um, like the king snake, she's a year and a half old; she's still growing, so I'll give her food about once every two weeks, uh, maybe once every ten days, depending on the, the season. But uh, the main thing I try to schedule around is actually when we're going to be doing shows because obviously I can't handle them right after they've been fed and most of our stuff is on the weekends. So I normally go through and either Sunday night or Monday, I'll go ahead and feed everyone. So they have as much time to digest as possible. And for the snakes that eat really big meals, like the carpets, the retic, I don't feed them all the same day. Like I'll stagger it so that he will eat on like the, the first Monday of the month. And then the, the retake will eat on the third Monday. So I can do everything I can to have at least one decent sized snake that's able to go. Makes sense. Very cool. Okay. Speaking very, very smart scheduling. Yeah. It, it's, it's uh, one of those things where you have to be careful because I figured out pretty quickly uh, the retake will digest in almost exactly a week. So if I feed him like on a Sunday night, I need to make sure that he is not going to defecate on me on a Saturday morning while I have him out in front of a hundred <laughs> school kids, which has happened. Oh, I, uh, I believe yeah, it. Yeah, literally a hundred school kids. And he, uh, he starts, you know, uh, getting rid of everything that I fed him a week ago. You know, those kids are still telling that story though. Like, oh yeah. Like, yeah. The, the time the big snake pooped on the guy with the hat. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I would tell that story till I died. Yeah, I, I mean, I've seen that uh, meme coming around. I don't know if you guys have seen it yet, but it's just like a, a text post. And it's like, you remember how elementary schools would just sometimes have a guy with a big snake come out? Who was that man? What were his credentials? <laughs> and I've had three people send it to me in the last day and a half. That makes and sense. That, yeah. I love it because I've actually had a couple people send that to me because that's what I want to do. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, no, I, I can tell you my credentials, but, you know, like, my my response is always just, I have a cool hat and a big snake. I mean, that's really... What more do you need? When I was a kid, that's all you needed. Yeah, so, right? I mean, if you ask any questions, they put you on a Galapagos tortoise and told you to suck it up. Um, speaking of reticulated python for the last 10 minutes, like, let's get her mouth. Oh, yeah. yeah, let me Who's go ahead. Her own reticulated python. It's, I'm not a snake guy, but that's pretty big, right, Nat? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. All right. Yeah, no, especially retics, even as a juvenile, are, are rather large. And like he mentioned, a lot of people power feed and then accidentally power feed. They think, oh, I have to feed my snake every week or I have to feed my snake every two weeks. And in most cases, you don't. So I'm really glad he brought that up. So this is Apollo. He's our adult male retic. Oh. Uh, he's actually about to go into shed. I didn't realize... Uh, how far along he was. He's getting a little bit cloudy, so his coloring's kind of muted, but uh, I just had him in the bath, which is why I have the towel on me. But he's, um, he's a sweetheart. Oh he's, my um, he's gorgeous. Don't the others, but he's one of my favorite snakes. Okay. Gorgeous. Yeah, he's... Uh, I mean, that coloring and markings, I've... I, goodness, that is gorgeous. Like, I, I can't even speak properly. <laughs> Now, this oh, yeah. wait, really... wait about a week and a half and he's going to be stunning. Uh, so oh, wow. he's a tiger motley mochino uh, retic. Uh, at least that is what I've been told by breeders I've asked. He came to us as a rescue. Uh, okay. So he was a, uh, a, a seizure when his owner was arrested for getting in a bar fight and stabbing somebody. Sounds like a snake owner. <laughs> I thought you were going to say meth because that's I, I don't a snake know. owner. I mean... All I know is that he was going away for a while, and uh, when the police went to his apartment, they found a collection of like half a dozen big retics, okay. and uh, they were they were in good shape, but obviously, you know, he, they couldn't stay there. And uh, Harris County Animal Control does not handle reptiles. Okay. So a volunteer at the shelter uh, took them and brought them to a reptile rescue that we work with, and they contacted us and said, "Hey, we just got a bunch of retics." that came in, do you want one? We were in, you know, kind of in the market for a, a big, uh, impressive snake. 
and uh, his temperament impressive is absolutely is incredible. Definitely a great word to use for him because that is in magnificent, magnificent species. Yeah, no, goodness, the, or specimen the, of that species, I should say. Yeah, no, the the term that I like to use for like the the big animals that you bring out at the end is the showstopper. Okay. Oh yeah. Making an amazing grand finale, like nothing is going to trump this. So I'm not going to bring him out first and then have it be you know a tortoise and a gecko and a a sugar glider, but um, yeah, you know, right. everyone remembers the the ten foot yellow snake that the guy brought out of the box. Ah, oh, dang, we did it backwards. <laughs> you should have asked for the tortoise. <laughs> no, she's cute. Don't worry. So how long is he? How long is he? Uh, he is uh, just over ten feet by our our best measurement. Um, I we will let him out to kind of roam around the reptile house sometimes, and okay. once he was stretched out almost completely straight along a wall. And so I kind of marked where his head was and his tail was, and I measured it later and just about 10 feet. Smart, smart. I would have tried to run and get a tape measure, and then he would not be where I left him. And yeah. Yeah, that's how I would do it. Completely, but uh, I. I so mean, what's a typical a meal for this guy? Uh, so we, again, don't overfeed him. He'll get um, miniature donkey. Either, like a large rat or um, an adult an adult quail. I literally feed him the same thing as the carpet pythons, believe it or not. Okay. Um, I was going to say, because he, his muscular structure is a proper muscular structure. And when I say that is because it reminds me of the wild ones that you would see in the book. Like yeah, anytime really. I was like a kid going through all my crazy books, because I was obsessed with reptiles at a young age, then that's the size you would see like along a branch. You don't see the huge and then that itty bitty little chubby mm -hmm. tail. You yeah. Know, tiny like... hail and a little, uh, little pinhead on the other end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, he, I can't take the credit for that. He came to me full sized, but um, I've been careful not to overfeed him since then. But uh, it's, it's crazy how like, you know, he can get by on one meal a month that, you know, is maybe the size of a, a big grapefruit. That is crazy. And he digests it in a week. So then he's got three weeks to just live off that energy, basically, mm -hmm. right? And yeah, he can really, live I uh, actually was listening to a really great podcast a few weeks ago, maybe a month or so. Uh, Marilia Python Radio, they had a uh, professional herpetologist on who was talking about snake digestion. And okay. boas and pythons apparently will shut their, uh, like their digestive system down when they don't have food in their stomachs. Like they'll stop producing stomach acid. They don't produce mucus to line the digestive tract. Uh, when wow. they don't have food, and then when they do eat, it sends their metabolism into overdrive. Uh, like the the act of digesting that food is like sprinting on a treadmill for them. Like their heart rate increases, their respiration increases. Uh, so that's why it's so bad to power feed your pythons because it's like having them sprint on a treadmill every day, nonstop, their entire life. Yeah, their heart's gonna give out at some point. Oh, poor baby. Now we know. Well, like, we and, and I was just telling Josh, like, as you went to go get him, that I'm really glad you mentioned the fact that people overfeed their snakes mm -hmm. a lot of time. Yeah. And and I even mentioned how some people accidentally power feed. Yeah. They yeah. don't realize because they're going off of all these guides, like, oh, feed after two days of them defecating, feed after, you know, mm -hmm. like right after this. And it's, it, it's yeah, kind of like, sad to see that yeah. they're shortening the life of their animal without realizing it. Yeah, like my my thing is, you know, they they will go for months at a time without food in the wild. Like they're okay skipping a meal. If if you're in doubt, wait a week and and they'll be fine. They're not going to die if they're, you know, presumably a, a healthy snake. They can go an extra week without food and it's probably good for them. Like uh, a lot of people have started kind of food cycling their snakes so they they won't feed them for several months out of the year. Uh, because, you know, they would do that in the, the wild during the dry season or whatever. But, uh, no, like, the, the default is kind of, you know, feed your snake, uh, you know, a, a white mouse once a week, whatever, you know, or whatever appropriately sized animal that is, whether it's a, a guinea pig or a rabbit or a rat or whatever, and that, that just doesn't fit every single species. For sure. Exactly. For sure. Yeah, because, like, how you're going to feed him isn't going to be the same way as my friend's going to feed their false water cobra. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's, it's, it's going to be completely different. Yeah, no, like you, you should be giving falsies everything that you can get, like fish, frog legs, um, you know, lizards, if you have a source for them, birds, mammals. I feed 
like my carpets especially like most of their diet is birds i i don't think i've given either of them a wrap in four or five months okay i love fowl i'd, I'd prefer fowl over yeah over it's, rodents for it's, sure it's a, it's a much leaner protein uh they digest the feathers so much better uh like you know i'll i'll see the difference in their feces when they get rodents the fur is all in there uh you can break it apart it's mostly hair uh with feathers there's none of that you're not seeing down in there you're not seeing feathers so they're digesting it more efficiently it's basically keratin right the feathers yeah yeah it's, it's all okay. keratin uh, but for some reason they can handle feathers a lot better than they can hair i don't know if maybe they break it down because there's more nutritional value in it i i don't know honestly we had a comment here from somebody online. Um, so you, when I think this came in when you were talking about not feeding them for a couple months. Would that be more of a diet pause thing? Like obviously in the dry season, they're not. Oh, hibernate. Um, it's not yeah, a hibernation. That, that depends on the species. Like obviously, oh, hang on, the carpet's uh, cruising. Uh, but yeah, like obviously a, a corn snake, a king snake, like a North American colubrid is not going to eat during the winter. Okay. But for, you know, a python, like a, a carpet or a, a retic, there's going to be a dry season and a wet season rather than, you know, winter, summer, spring, and fall. Oh, so okay. the dry season in the summer, usually, I, I mean, I think it's the summer, is when they're not going to be eating. And the wet okay. season is when they're going to be eating. They're going to be moving around because it's not going to be blistering hot. They're going to be breeding at that time. So like that kind of cycle, rather than, you know, trying to force a tropical python to work on a, a corn snake's schedule is uh, what's given people a lot more success keeping and breeding these animals. Fantastic. Can we, um, I don't want to keep you all night long. I will if you want to, but um, can we see the leopard tortoise? That yeah, leopard absolutely. Tortoise? Let me put this guy back and I'll. Uh, he's awesome. I could talk about that snake for another hour. Dude, he's gorgeous. He gorgeous. I have never seen oh. one. Like I've seen obviously the albinos and stuff like that, but not like a coffee, yeah. toffee, flit, like colored. Yeah. Oh, it's so pretty. He's a cappuccino. Trademark. Yeah, ca Copyright. Is, right. Cappucci Boom. Cappuccino. <laughs> oh, it's so cool. It's so beautiful. Like I want a shirt like that color, <laughs> like with right. that design on it. <laughs> that would look so cool. Oh, so beautiful. Oh, I'm so excited for this adorable tortoise. I want to see how baby it is because I know they come in like, like this big, right? <laughs> like those Egyptian tortoises. I looked into those. That's about full size for them, and they're so cute. They kind of look like baby leopard tortoises. Um, oh my goodness! But they're like fifteen hundred bucks. Oh goodness! Yeah, they, they have oh, the brook field. Oh, oh, You're right. oh! He's he's using the tiny hands. Oh, yeah, he is. So this is Lilith. <gasps> she is our hatchling leopard tortoise. She's only about uh, maybe two, three months old at the most. Um, oh and we did not produce her here. She uh, came from a, a breeder nearby, but she is tiny and she is adorable and super sweet. My heart just exploded. Look at her. She's just ready to be on camera. She's just, hello. How's it going? I yeah. love their chunky legs. Like, oh. I love how they already have the little old man legs. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> They've got the little spurs on either side of their tail. Uh, those, oh will, my goodness. those will get a little bit bigger in an adult, but they're already there. And uh, yeah, she's just absolutely oh. adorable. So she can get oh my face. goodness. Cutie so what's their booze. growth rate? Like how, like obviously I'm going to say, uh, now I'm going to rephrase that. What is the general growth rate? Because I know they're all individual. Like, for example, my mm -hmm. Tegu, she was only supposed to get three feet, and she's 46 inches. So um, so, and so, I know it, it, it varies, but generally, is it slower? Is it pretty uh, quick, like the first tortoises, year, or is it kind of gradual? For tortoises, it should be very slow. Um, if you grow them too quickly, you're going to risk pyramiding in the shell where you get kind of those those uh pumps oh that's shell. how that happens uh so there there's debate over whether it's related to humidity or diet i think it's a little bit of both um so as you can see she uh came out of the egg a couple of months ago there's already a little bit of a, a dip between the scutes yeah. right there in the, the middle oh, wow um, yeah yeah you can see a little a little bit of that's kind of unavoidable in captive tortoises 
Uh, leopard tortoises are also kind of prone to it because they, uh, for whatever reason, their shells are just kind of naturally triangle shaped. But um, yeah, so the, the thing I try to avoid is uh, feeding foods that are too rich in sugar or protein. So oh, uh, like okay. we have a lot of uh, red foot tortoises, including some that we've raised up from, you know, that size and they're getting to be about, you know, yay big. And their shells look pretty good uh, compared to some I've seen. They look really good, but um, like you want to avoid feeding them too much fruit. You want to avoid feeding them too much protein, like hard boiled eggs, um, dog food. Like I, I don't think I'll ever give dog food to a tortoise. Uh, box turtles are another story. Uh, we, we have tons of box turtles and they want to eat three things, uh, fruit, meat, and uh, Missouri tortoise chow. Okay. Those are the only three things that they want. Like I've never seen a box turtle eat greens willingly, but if you throw a, like a dead rat in there, it'll be gone in an hour. You're just cramming it. They're, the they're savages. Eat your salad. <laughs> I learned something new today. Oh yeah, like if something something else new today. Someone has a, a box turtle and you can't get it to eat, you literally give it give it a dead rat, and then prepare to be horrified. You will never look at them the same way again. I didn't know they were savages. I didn't even like, know they ate meat like oh, that. Oh yeah, they're they're that omnivores. Is... Like they're they they will eat fruit. They'll eat Josh, plants, did you know mushrooms, this? meat. I knew they um, ate bugs. I knew they oh, ate yeah, bugs. They love bugs. Um, um, like beetles and grubs and stuff. I knew that. Um, yeah. I didn't know that they. I, you know what though? I would think that makes sense that they're scavengers. Like mm -hmm. um, painted turtles and red eared sliders. Like I know that they're big scavengers if they can find it. They're not great hunters except for my friend Dale's. Um, She's a murderer. <laughs> so yeah, I, I gave uh, some baby red eared sliders uh, minnows once, and okay. that was traumatizing. I was about 12 years old, and I had heard they would eat fish. So I went and I got some, some little minnows at the pet store, put them in the tank, and thought, okay, yeah, they might snack on them, you know, over the next few weeks. Those fish were gone in an hour. <laughs> yeah. I had two baby red eared sliders, and I put them in a tank that I had uh, a good colony of ghost shrimp in. And I, to my knowledge, they never caught one. They would chase it with their mouth open, and the shrimp were like, nah, F this, like, I'm out of here. I guess the shrimp are better at surviving than the fish then. Yeah, well, they were ghost shrimp, so they're basically see-through. But it was funny to watch them swim after them with their mouth open. She's adorable. Yeah. So what's her favorite snack right now? Um, right now, she's actually pretty good. Um, something I've had trouble with the Redfoots is getting them to eat the things they're supposed to. Uh, okay. Like they, they want to eat the things that are bad for them, just like you know, little kids. Sure, but she's like pretty good. Uh, she's not spoiled. She'll eat arugula, um, all kinds of greens. I gave her some hibiscus leaves the other day, and like surprisingly, she loved those. Snapped okay. them right up. Uh, I saw she, somebody on YouTube giving them uh, they grow hibiscus flowers in their yard just for their salcada. Yeah. Yeah, so we, he went nuts. Yeah, we we have maybe a dozen hibiscus bushes outside. Um, and they're starting to flower again after the winter, but, uh, the flowers, everything eats those like tortoises, iguanas, bearded okay. dragons, uh, whatever the leaves though are something I didn't expect, but that's, that's a nice little thing to add to her salad mix. That's cool. awesome. Yeah. I, I would never have thought of the leaves. Cause yeah, I mean, a friend of mine, she has a prehensile tailed skink. A oh yeah. Skink. Those are awesome. And yeah, she gave it a snack of a hibiscus flower and he um, devoured it and just moments. Yeah. Uh, They're I don't, sassy. He probably knows this, but uh, like uh, golden pothos is the best thing to feed them. It's part of their natural diet in the Solomon islands. Okay. So curious about that because I got approved that I can get one. So <laughs> um, I'm growing pothos. I have a humongous plant that I've been doing all mm -hmm. organic with like no pesticides, no nothing. The Excellent. fertilizer is even all organic. So that way, once I get this amazing lizard, I can actually feed it its natural food. There was a huge debate about that um, on Facebook that people were like, no, no, only give them four to five leaves. Like you don't want that to be their, their main food source. So it's interesting to hear now, not now, but somebody reaffirmed that yes, pothos is actually a really good option because- oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't feed exclusively that, like you want them of to course. eat all kinds of, of you know, greens and, and vegetables. But yeah, like if, if I was able to keep one alive in an enclosure with one, I would absolutely have that. 
the problem is they'll decimate it in a, a week. You know, they'll just eat they, the entire thing. He did. He did. She she put a plant in there for him as like a treat one day. Actually, really, she was trying to decorate, and it became a treat for him one yeah. day. Um, but yeah, she, he destroyed it in a within I think she said like twelve to eighteen hours. The the plant was gone. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, you, you would need to have like a a, a room-sized enclosure just covered in it for them to have any chance of not destroying it all. Okay. Oh, she's trying to eat my keys. <laughs> well, all right. Uh, uh, the angle doesn't work, but yeah, she's she's trying to eat the control key. Oh, oh on the keyboard. Oh. All right. I thought you meant like the car key. No, no, me. like she's, she's sitting on the keyboard and she's looking down at one of them like, yeah. So yeah. if we lose you, we know why the tortoise. We had never had tortoise problems before on this show, but why not? I think this would be a good, good first. Every episode, every episode, something goes wrong. Um, can you get the sugar glider out while she's out, or is that going to be an uh, issue? I'll, I'll go ahead and put her back. It's just okay. kind of chilly out here. I want to get her back under her, her leg. Okay, sure, sure. Oh, she's adorable. If I If I didn't have, like... I don't think I have 60 years left on this earth to have her, so. And I don't plan on having kids, so I can't write them in my will. <laughs> yeah. Oh. My kid will super outlive me. I just realized why the carpet python was so intent on coming over here. Because the sugar glider's out? Yes. Uh, so I'm going to put him up as well. Just to He's trying to get a sugar glider. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. He smelled that food. That is so funny. I love it. The sugar gliders are interesting. I remember I wanted one as a pet, and then I did a bunch of research on it, and I said, never mind. <laughs> yeah, that's that's kind of what I tell people. But yeah, I, I totally forgot he was here. And then the uh, Chester came over, and I, I heard you know kind of scrambling noises, and I realized that uh, he's been you know looking at this little guy for the last hour and a half. I'm back. Oh, oh, she's white. Yep. So this is Ray. He is a uh, sugar glider. I am not well versed in the mutations, so I don't know what the correct name for this phase is, but he is white. Uh, normally they would be gray with a black stripe down the back. And uh, <laughs> he is going crazy for this honey. Um, oh, is that what that is? Yeah. Um, yeah. I just fill a syringe with honey and um, like he, he laps it right up. It makes it easy to keep his attention because before we started doing this, he would just climb all over me and uh, he would like to sit between my shoulder blades where I couldn't get to him. Sure. But uh, yeah, so I always tell people, you know, they're called sugar gliders because they are eating nectar and fruit and uh, tree sap and honeydew in the wild. So this is um, something that he absolutely loves and it uh, it's easy for me to just kind of dole out a couple drops at a time to keep his attention. He is definitely attentive. How old is he? Uh, he's about know, seven years age? old. He's, uh, he's another one that um, was a former pet. His his family had two and then the, the female passed away and they just they did not have interest in getting a second sugar glider. They didn't really have the time to spend with him. So okay. they were looking for a, a home that would give him some companionship and some attention and now he lives with our two females and uh, the three of them seem to be doing really well together. No kits yet? Uh, he's neutered, so no. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not planning on it. Um, I like sugar gliders in small doses, but at one point we had five of them and that was just too much. That's, that's a lot. smell. Yeah, no, they, they smell terrible. That's, that's one of the main things I tell people when they're, you know, fawning over him is, you know, get closer, get a whiff, and then decide if you want one of these. Yeah, yeah, like they're adorable, don't get me wrong. But oh, yeah. No, he's, he's basically a, a Disney sidekick in the making. I've had... If, if uh, Disney ever makes a movie set in Australia, this is going to be the, the princess sidekick. It better be. Oh, yeah. Were they in... I think they were in Rescuers Down Under. They had a couple sugar gliders show Oh, up. you know, they might be. I haven't watched that movie since I was about four years old. But I do remember. I, re, I remember Joanna the Goanna. Yes. So that would make sense yes. for them to have sugar gliders. And the golden oh, that's eagle. So funny. The yes. Golden eagle oh, that adopted yes. that boy. Yeah, adopted. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, the the thing that 
uh, I should have taken into account earlier is that these guys are a natural food source for carpet pythons. Okay, so no wonder so, he was on the roll. Yeah, no, Chester was uh, like channeling his ancestors. Oh my goodness, that is so funny. Yeah, the thankfully he thing. couldn't get to him. Like I, I had the pouch in a, a box, so like hard shell around it, but he was definitely looking, like he was sitting on the box looking in and uh, Ray was kind of, you know, like, <laughs> well, we, we try to avoid those stuff. kinds of uh, those kinds of interactions between our animals. That's fair. That's fair. Oh my gosh, that is so funny. Poor Ray. <laughs> oh, that would be traumatizing. Yeah, I'd have to stop here, show. Money, forget all about it. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, so you mentioned obviously all the nectar and everything else um, and honey for as a distraction, but obviously it's, they would consume a lot of high sugars because I assume they're very active. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, they have a, a very fast metabolism. Uh, we feed these guys a uh, prepared diet that like I, I make every couple of weeks with 14, 15 types of produce. Um, we throw in applesauce, egg yolk, insects, um, oatmeal, Avocado. They they love avocado. I don't know why. Uh, it's not something they would ever eat in the wild, but they go nuts for it. Um, and then we freeze that in an ice cube tray after blending it all together. But each one of them will eat uh, a full sized ice cube. It's almost almost half their body weight every night. Why are you wow. them so much? That's gross. Got to make them guacamole. Got to find out some mango guacamole and be all set. Yeah, they also love uh, animal protein. Like they'll eat insects, uh, eggs. Sometimes we'll give these guys like uh, little frozen fish or pinky mice, and they destroy those. My friend gave hers a pinky, and she said never again. She was traumatized. Like she heard that that was a thing, and uh, she said it was horrifying. She oh yeah, no, like that's uh, like I I used to work at a wolf sanctuary um, a while back, and we would do uh, whole prey for the, the wolves occasionally. Like whenever right. somebody donated a deer or uh, the game wardens would bring in some roadkill, we would have to carve that up and, and give the wolves, you know, each a piece of it. And you saw some pretty crazy stuff doing that. I remember one deer that was hit by a car was heavily pregnant with twins. Oh God. Uh, and so two of our older wolves each got a fetal deer and later that day, we had a school group come through. And uh, so this this old 13-year-old wolf named Big Boy comes walking up towards the front of the, the enclosure with uh, you know this thing hanging out of his mouth. And the kids are asking, is that a puppy? And then he gets closer and they're like, oh my God, that's so cool. I just wonder if that's entertaining for the wolf. Like, the wolf's like, watch this, guys. I'm going to freak out these kids. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, they're just stuck there. They're watching us the same as we're watching them, right? Oh, yeah. I, I loved working there. Um, like, the the education aspect of it was huge. Like, we would do tours for the public, and that was one of my favorite parts of the day. But I, I just loved the relationship that we were able to build with uh, some of the wolves and wolf dogs there. That's awesome. That's awesome. We got to visit a sanctuary, uh, my friends and I, back in the day. And so that was where we got to see a lot of rescued animals that were either raised in a situation that were all like Illinois animals. Mm -hmm. um, and then someone, somebody came through and like shot the animals up through their cages at night with what? BB guns. Yeah. And so they were all wounded. So they were at this rescue shelter after that. They shut down the whole program. Mm -hmm. And, um, it was like a park district thing where they had the animals on display basically to come see. Oh, them. okay. Like Local. native wildlife. Okay. Yeah. And some jerk came through with like an air pellet gun or something. And that's, uh, that's horrible. Yeah. So they had like a 15 year old bobcat and she was just a cuddle machine. Um, and there was a wolf that had been just raggedy old. Like all of these things were just super old. But um, it was kind of cool to see that they were still around in a sanctuary. So, uh, and they were very, very tame for what they were supposed to be, you know? <laughs> you know oh, yeah. We get to pet a wolf like it's a dog. He is just... Oh, yeah, are you having fun hiding from everyone? Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's like, I'm just in my own little world over he, here. He, I got he my loves honey. the pouch. 
He's like, they called me cute. I'm not cute. I'm manly. <laughs> <laughs> so, Drew, oh, how many I days a week so, is your so you, Zoom? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. I've been talking the whole time. Oh, so. Okay, fine. <laughs> well, uh, so you mentioned that you also bring a sugar glider when you go to like to schools and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And when, when you do your educational visits. Um, do you kind of rotate which ones you bring in, or is Ray kind of more team than the rest of them? I, or uh, Ray is definitely the most socialized. Uh, we've been working with one of the other females, Opal. Uh, we've started taking her and Ray out together. They are she's a little bit more calm with him in the pouch with her, uh, and she's she's been doing pretty well. Um, the other one, the other sister, Pearl, is evil. Uh, I tried taking her to a program. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, and never again. She managed to escape from the carrier, and was uh, like, when I got there and I opened up the back of the truck, she was just hanging from the ceiling of the truck. Oh! So I had to go catch her. Uh, during the show, she bit me six times, which is um, I have before that I had never been bitten by an animal in front of an audience, and so she she took that away from me, uh, and she was just generally not a pleasant animal to work with in front of an audience. So uh, wow. she is she is on leave until further notice. <laughs> but uh, no, the other two are good. Um, Ray is definitely the most social, which is why he, he came out. Like as soon as he saw I had honey, he jumped into the pouch and was ready to go. Okay, so, so he, he's yeah, pretty so trained. He's, he's, he's good. Um, Opal, we're working on it, but you know, we, we try to have backups. I would love to have another retick if I had the space, but uh, if, you know, like he's in shed or earlier this year, he had a respiratory infection because of that oh. big freeze we had. Uh, sure, sure. We had Chester kind of covering his, his shows and parties for a few weeks while he recovered. That's gotta be a challenge. Keeping it them is, all. It is. Um, you know, you'd in a perfect world, I would have at least two of everything, but that means double the space, double the food. And again, you know, to the average zoo going person, there's, you know, snakes, big snakes and cobras. So <laughs> like, yeah, like they're, uh, you know, you go into these zoo reptile houses and they might have something like, you know, every species of rattlesnake found in Arizona and Northern Mexico. And there's a lot of them, like there's, you know, a lot of rattlesnakes oh, yeah. in that area. So it's many cool. here. So many. And, and people will nerd out over it, but to the average person, it's like rattlesnake, rattlesnake, rattlesnake. Oh, that one's a little bit different color. Rattlesnake, rattlesnake, rattlesnake. And they're in and out in three minutes, and they, they didn't learn anything about the diversity of, of uh, rattlesnakes in Arizona. Right. That's for, like, people that really want to know about rattlesnakes. Yeah. And those no, like people I, are you and far between. Yeah. I, I think the problem is you put a reptile nerd in charge of planning the reptile collection, and they're just going to go crazy collecting all the things that they are interested in because, you know, if you if you give a nerd a large budget and say go crazy, they're going to do it. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Like you should see – I'll send you a video after the show or I'll put it up here on the channel of the ant farm that I built. It's it's insane. I would love it, to see that. I, it's I not on par ants, with – But I have no idea what I'm doing with them, and it, it would not go well. It's pretty simple. Um, it's one of those hobbies. Don't too, let like them I'm escape. Sure you know. Yeah, they escaped already. Yeah, yeah. Oh, after boy. last week's show, was it last week? Yeah. After last week's show, I went to check I on my friends over. Week. I had friends over Sunday. Um, I showed them the ant farm, which was pretty hillbilly. To be fair, it's a hillbilly ant farm. Um, I put it away, and one of the tubes had come loose when I put it away and I didn't notice. Oh yeah. So Sunday or Tuesday after the show. So two days later, um, I go to check on my animals. Cause after the show, I'll check my animals. Maybe not tonight. Cause it's already running late. Um, and they were gone. Like the first thing I notice is the nest is empty. And oh, then the no. second thing I notice is the tube is off and I'm like, no. So Nat was the only one on the call with me. So I'm freaking out. I finally was like, Hey, I have to hang up on you. And they were in a potted plants right above their nest where their nest was. So um, when I picked up the potted plant, I got attacked savagely, oh, uh, yeah. but I got them back. I got them we, back. We have fire ants all over the place out here. Oh. Um, they're, they're invasive. So nothing's eating them and right. they're, they're horrible. 
Like, yeah, I, I go out and I'm, I'm treating anthills almost every week because new ones pop up this time of year. And well, I, that's a thing for animals if they're outside, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, no, I'm, I live in fear of, you know, going out there and, you know, ants have attacked a tortoise or a lizard or, you know, some other animal that I have out there and they can't get away because they're in an enclosure. Right. And they're savages. Like, those, those ants are savage, awful. Mm -hmm. No, they're, they're horrible. Not good. So, um, like I was trying to say, we've had you on quite a long time. I appreciate oh, your yeah. time. Yeah. Um, we're going to post your link. We're going to post, um, that'll have all your information on it. But like, as a, as an aside, like how many days a week are you open, open? Uh, so right now we're actually not open, open. Uh, we're, oh. we're kind of open by, by appointment. You have to reserve either a VIP tour, uh, where you can come out and get a, a guided tour of the zoo, feed tortoises, uh, meet the, the petting zoo animals get a, you know, kind of a hands-on reptile encounter, or you can uh, book a birthday party out at the zoo, field trip, something, you know, kind of group oriented. Okay. And then we also go out to uh, parties, school programs, uh, scout troops, summer camps, uh, and all of that. But right now we aren't just open to drop by and walk around. We don't have the, the staff okay. to manage all that. So this is your full-time gig right now. Almost, almost. I, I'm okay. working two days a week at my, my day job still. Um, okay. So I'm doing that just until everything is finished getting off the ground. But uh, a couple months ago, I had to make a shift because it was getting to the point where I, I couldn't manage everything and still work five days a week. Oh, of course. Wow. That's just, that's such a challenge. But the... right. Yeah, I, I don't know what sleep is anymore. Let's put it that way. Right. I feel like people in this field that have a job in the field, for the most part, the employers take advantage of their love of what they do. Oh, absolutely. The love of their job will keep them in a job um, more than the pay. And I think that's not fair because the expertise that those people that love the hobby or the profession bring to the job um, is invaluable. Oh, yeah. Like for for everything that zookeepers need to know, about science, public speaking, hands-on building skills, like everything that they need to know. Yeah. They are probably one of the most underpaid professions in the world. And I'm, I'm not just saying that because I am one, but it's, <laughs> it's insane. No, it's true. It's, it's, it's right there, We're almost right along teachers. Like teachers mm -hmm. need to get their, their degrees and all these certifications yeah. and to work yeah. at a college or even, or even at a elementary school, you know, and you're getting 35, if you're lucky 35 mm -hmm. grand a year. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I have a master's degree and the most I've ever made in a, a zoo job was about that much. And that was when I was working for a, a city zoo and getting government benefits. That's crazy. Yeah. That's cra and yeah, you're that working is. hard. You're working long days. Oh, yeah. Hard work. yeah. And like, I, I mean, I'll, I'll rant on this if you let me, but like, I think the big problem is, you know, in, in other fields, you know, like workers can, can negotiate a little bit harder because they can walk off the job, they can strike. We can't really do that because, you know, there are animals that need medication three times a day that, you know, won't eat if they're not with the same person that they're used to working with. You know, like you, you can't do that. So, right. I mean, right. I don't want to say they're, the guilt. they're hostages, but yeah. the animals are kind of hostages to keep keepers from pushing a little bit harder. Right. I, that's that's not to say like all zoo management or owners are greedy people. There's not a lot of money in the field to begin with, but for what the qualifications are to get into this job, for what uh, you have to know, how hard you work, it's it's incredibly sad how little people make. Like I I know people who have left the field even though they love it just because they cannot pay their bills or they yeah. have two part time jobs on top of it which is insane because like you're saying to upkeep those animals and the training and mm -hmm. that's an incredibly yeah. difficult job. And just what you're doing overall, you know, spreading the knowledge of them and, and the conservation of it is, it's a huge deal. And it's, it's unfortunate that it's not as, it's not as well, if you will, like congratulated, you know, it's like, Oh, yeah, you became a zookeeper. You yeah. know, and it's like, yeah. it's like, no, no, I became a zookeeper. Like I'm taking yeah. care of these animals. Like I'm taking initiative to, 
to study why some of these animals are doing the things they do or, or why they're not doing certain things anymore. So, yeah, I mean, it's, we, we, you know, you, you hear about the, the parents telling their kids, you know, go to school or you're going to end up scooping elephant poop. Excuse me, ma'am. I have a master's degree <laughs> and did three unpaid internships so that I could scoop this elephant poop and I am loving it. This, <laughs> all right. You just reminded me. I have a question that's boggled me since I was a child. We go to the zoo all the time. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with Brookfield Zoo in Illinois. Lincoln oh, yeah, Park. yeah. Like, up near Chicago, yeah. Sure. So I have a membership to Brookfield Zoo, and we go probably 30 times a year. We went three times last week. Where do they put the poop? There has to be tons of poop a week. Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. Um, so I think it depends on the zoo. I know... Some places like uh, Woodland Park Zoo in Seattle run a massive composting operation because they have the space. Oh, yeah. Like okay. they, they're literally turning it with backhoes to compost it all. Uh, and that's what I do as well. I mean, I, I have a much smaller collection, but pigs, goats, rodents, birds, uh, you know, everything, the, the hay, grass clippings, used bedding, it all goes into a compost pile. Um, and I, you know, go out there a couple times a week and turn it and it's ending up in our flower beds, uh -oh. which is great uh, because, okay. you know, I'm not paying for compost. I'm not paying to get rid of it. But um, no, when I was at Santa Fe, we had a we had the fecal pile, which was out on the, the backside of the zoo. And it was a 20 foot high mound that you just would dump everything into. And uh, I think it just kind of sat there. And it was composed I suppose. eventually, like very slowly, but especially after like deep cleaning the otter exhibit, it would stink. Oh, uh, if you've never been around otters, don't do it. They are the worst smelling animal in the world. It's well, horrible. and they're mean too, right? I heard that they're mean. I have a cousin they that works They can give you a apartment. really nasty bite. Um, okay. They're not necessarily mean, but if they do decide to bite you, you are going to need stitches. Okay. Um, but yeah, just... They're, they're mustelids, so they're related to ferrets, they're related to skunks, and they eat fish. That'll be a stink. Yeah, they, they also have this wonderful behavior where they use a latrine where they all you know go to the bathroom in the same area, and then so that the entire family smells the same, they will dance and roll in it. <laughs> These so, are great facts. That we're yeah, learning. yeah. Don't they so also if have anyone a scent has ever thought about getting a pet otter, uh, I would invite you to go smell one first. Yeah, don't do that. I heard they have a scent gland too that they mark. Yes, yeah, that's, that's even worse. worse. Yeah, they'll rub that all over stuff. Uh, they're oily anyway to waterproof their fur. That was probably the most smelly enclosure at that zoo was uh, the otters. Lesson learned. Lesson learned. My cousin works at the aquarium up here, and uh, they or she did. I don't know if she's still there, but they said that the otters, the sea otters that they had would escape. Like they had to put different locks on the cage every three months because they would figure out how to open it. Oh my pretty God. Pretty much no matter what they used. And they were savages. Yeah. Like they would come after you to try to bite you. Yeah. So you just walk yeah, into work and there'd be a loose otter. Yeah, their, their paws are creepy. They're, they're literally little hands. Okay. And like they'll, they'll reach out and they'll try to grab things and touch you. And it's like, it's a little, uh, <laughs> I was not an otter trainer, but I had friends who were. Yeah. They always smelled like cat food. And uh, like watching them get their, their hands like pawed over by the otters was the creepiest thing ever. You just had a sugar glider on you with tiny hands. Come on now. It took me a while to get okay with that. Like their okay. hands are almost too human for me. I, um, I raised two squirrels from babies uh, at two separate times. And... They had the creepy little. My friends called them werewolves because they look like tiny werewolves when they're yep. when they're hyper. Um, all right, that's so many tangents. This is definitely the most tangentous episode, but I think they're all great tangents. So, Drew, thank you so much for coming and spending time with us. Yeah, well, thank um, you for having me. This has been great. I really appreciate. Yeah, it. I think I learned stuff. Nat learned stuff. So many things. See, which is new because she's our expert. She's our reptile expert, so that's awesome. Well, I'm I'm glad that uh, I was able to make it a good episode. Hopefully, uh, we can do this again sometime. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. yes. Like we we'd love to try to have people back on, kind of like an updated and 
you know, hey, I got this now or I have this and, you know, just, mm -hmm. it would yeah. be amazing. Yeah. You've been an absolute pleasure. Very, very knowledgeable. Like I said, you've definitely changed my viewpoint on a lot of different things. I've learned a lot of things and we can only hope that the audience did as well. Um, and so we're really, really glad and excited that you decided to come on. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks so much. And um, we'll see you soon, probably. I think our scheduled appointments are done in September. So I'm going to start recycling guests and having a couple more back on. So okay. um, I would love to see where you're at in like six months, where you're zooming yeah. in six yeah, months. Yeah, we should have some uh, some good stuff to talk about by then. Absolutely. I mean, we could have good stuff to talk about tomorrow if we wanted to. Yeah. So <laughs> um, we'll definitely have some updates from you. And I don't know. I'm just saying six months. That's arbitrary. So, but Definitely. we will be in touch. And I hope we've built friendships too. So, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. much. Have a great night. Thank you. You too. Have a great night. Oh, I cut him off. I cut him off. Oh, well, what was that? No, I, I was just saying, I'll, uh, let's see. Let's see if I can figure out how to stop the video. Oh, you can just close your window. There he goes. Boom. All right. So he's gone. Finally, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> that was awesome. That, that was, was awesome. So that was one cool. of my favorite episodes yet. I say that every week. I didn't but... know, no, literally, like I'm mind blown. Like I really am. Like I, I had no idea that yeah. crocodilians were more. Like I knew reptiles obviously stemmed or dinosaurs stemmed, went to birds. You know, like they have very, yeah. very similar you know, different features and stuff like that. The reproductive and digestive systems are very similar, but the fact that crocodilians are even more so to birds than they are even to reptiles. I have to be honest. I want to check on that because if they were around before dinosaurs and dinosaurs turned into birds, that's weird to me, but he would know. He wouldn't just throw that fact out there. I need to look into that though. I want to see the Well, well the especially the fact that like, like, like how good their hearing is. Yeah. You know, like, like, like there are some reptiles that I don't know if they choose to ignore you or not, or the like sound just doesn't really bother them. Right. So they're more visual, the fact right? that they're, they're so tuned to it, but I mean, it makes sense. Like I shoot, I know this crazy little one that I have back here. As soon as I turn that doorknob, he knows I'm coming in to feed him. So Which one is that? <laughs> what was that? Oh, the, the, the little stores monitor. Let me see. Oh, there we go. I can put it this way. Okay. Actually, let's do Oops, wrong one. Don't hang up on but us. But yeah, no, no. Oh, he knows. See him all sleeping? He's passed out now. He's but had a yes. Big day. Yeah, no, he's he had a really big day. Cool. So they've got no, super that was, senses. That's so crazy. Like, and how vocal they are. Like, uh, like I know visually, they have like really good vision, they've got really great sense of smell. Um, they can smell underwater, and, right? Adding that that fact that they can hear you as well, like that's terrifying. That's like a super predator. That is a super predator. Is, they are because they can jump super high. They can run fast. You can't outrun a crocodile. You can outrun a gator. Try to outrun a crocodile. Have fun with that. Well, you got a couple minutes, you, or like what do you got? Like a hundred yards to outrun them. Like, I don't they can't know. Run fast for long. Like it's like thirty-five yeah. miles an hour, but it's for like. A short distance. Like a short burst. I, I think they're, I got to look into it. Because I know some lizards, they can't breathe while they're running. Oh. Yeah. I know that so they like, head starts, they can blast them out of the water. Oh, yeah. And then you, you have to take a second to shit your pants. And then you can get away. <laughs> and then you can run. And yeah. zigzag, hopefully. But I'm sure they're used to that. So they don't have a sense of taste, really. So. <laughs> anyway. That was a great episode. If you guys don't, that was a great click, show. If you're new here and you don't click like and subscribe today, I don't know how to get you to like and subscribe this show. So, um, Nat's wearing a great blouse. We had a great right? guest. She's over there now. Uh, we had a great guest. He didn't have his hat on. That's okay. Oh, we should have asked him to put on the hat after he mentioned it. I left mine at my mom's at, from the zoo the other day. So, <laughs> um, but that was awesome. But yeah, so, that was that was a phenomenal show. Yeah. I can't next wait to have week, him back. You know, it's awful. I don't have my schedule down here either. I don't know who next <laughs> week is. Honestly, well, I don't know. We'll, we'll announce it on ISO, buddies. I'll keep you posted. I'll announce it on YouTube, too. <laughs> so there, there I'll, you go. I'll post a video on the ad farm once they move in. 
So, Ooh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's really cool. It's, if you haven't seen the I'm video excited. of Ice and Buddies, the, did you see the video? Uh, of the, yes! The build? I'm yeah. so pumped. So cool. But they're being such jerks, so they don't want to move in. <laughs> anyway, we're going to be up chatting some more about what we learned today. So uh, if you want to join us, it probably won't be for too long, but we'll be at the Ice and Buddies uh, Facebook page yep. in a room. So hope to see you there. Have a great day. Like, subscribe, click that button. 